Friday. Good evening. I would like to say thank you for giving me the honor and privilege to share with you in your summer series. I pray that your series have been very fruitful thus far. And I pray that what I have to share tonight will be a blessing to you, will aid you in your maturation in Christ. Quick background. My name is Winfred Felton III. I am an evangelist and elder at the Winterville Church of Christ in Winterville, North Carolina. I, my bride of 30 years is Leslie. She is a speech therapist and we will celebrate 31 years next month. I've been blessed with a daughter who just graduated from college in December with a degree in uh, music performance with a concentration in vocal, um, classic music. Our son, um, he's a junior in college and his major is um, music performance as well. His concentration area is bassoon. So um, God has blessed us with two very musical children. And so with that in mind, I would like to move on into my topic for tonight or the theme, Light Out of Darkness. As you think about this theme, this topic for the summer, I pray that it's more than just a teaching point. I pray that it's more than just an area where you can discuss theological ideas. But I pray that it's a reality for you individually, for your family, for your congregation, that it impacts your city, that it impacts your state, that it impacts your world in such a way that it put a smile on God's face. Our nation is facing a pandemic at the current time. And as we know, it has crippled our economy. It's a pandemic that has, that seemed to have even expanded the divide of our nation politically. But not only that, it has exposed the shameful reality of race relationship among folks in our nation. There is an intensity at hand right now, but it's not one of the light is one of darkness. The reason I say this is because of the evidence that's before us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 reads, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan has done his job well. His whole goal is to keep the world blinded from seeing the light of the gospel. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, John writes, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The very first place that we learn of light or hear about light in the book of, in the Bible is in the book of Genesis. Genesis 1 verses 3 through 5. It reads, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. We learn in this verse that this light that God allowed to inhabit the earth was not the sun or the moon or the stars at this point. Because that didn't come about until the fourth day in Genesis 1 verses 14 through 19. We read that, but let's first take a look at what happened in the creation on the first day. I find this quite interesting. God, in the presence of darkness, said, let there be light. And it was light. 
And he saw the goodness in that light. The goodness that was mingled among the darkness. And so what God did, he separated the light from the darkness. And he called the light day. And he called the darkness night. God did this. I'm just sharing this for some foundational um, reasons. As we think about light out of darkness. Here's the very first place we see that. It's right there in Genesis chapter 1. But God who is light, that created, that said let there be light, and from light he made day. And separated that from darkness, which he called night. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, um, I'm praying that you guys are familiar with this text. God said, let us make man in our image. There are a lot of things you can think about when it comes to the character and nature of God. But I hope one of those things is light. Because God is light. And he made man in his image. In their image. So Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 12 it reads, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have, but excuse me, but will have the light of life. I encourage you to go back and read that entire chapter. Just read the context of that to see what Jesus is communicating. What happened before he said that statement and what happened after he said that statement. In chapter 8. And then keep on reading in chapter 9. You'll see his sixth miracle there. But it was a man who was born blind. And he says, again, he is the light of the world. Um, there are some questions surrounding why was this man born blind? And Jesus said to display the glory of God. It wasn't because his parents sinned. It wasn't because he sinned. But this was done so that God's glory could be displayed in him. As we think about this tonight, light out of darkness. I want you to think about it in terms of God's glory being displayed in us. I mean, we see it in creation. We see it with the blind man. We see it even when he makes man in his, in his own image. And so to look at this um, particular topic, I want to look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. I'm going to skip over the salt part because I've, I've been talking about light, but we all know that in order for salt to be effective, it has to be out of the shaker. Amen? It doesn't season anything if you just keep it in the container. It's of no value. So, but I want to look here at Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Since we know God is light, and Jesus says he is the light of the world. Now notice the difference between the two. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, but um, Paul writes, not Paul, but excuse me, John writes, God is light. So as we look at this text and we try to make some applications to it, um, think about it in the context, in terms of light out of darkness, in terms of bringing God glory. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Notice the purpose behind that. So let's examine this text. First, he starts by saying, you are the light of the world. Notice this. That God is light. Jesus in John chapter 8 verse 12 says, I am the light of the world. And in Matthew chapter 5 verse 14, Jesus tells those who will follow him, you are the light of the world. Shouldn't be surprising. Because Colossians 3 verses 3 and 4 said, you have died and you are, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Just listen to that. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. The reason I share that passage, if God is light, Jesus is the light of the world, and I am hidden in Christ, in God, then I am also the light of the world because of who I am in, Christ Jesus. And so for you, as you're sitting here thinking about this, I want you to get a little bit excited about it. You are the light of the world. That's how God designed you. God, who is light, designed you to be light, to reflect this image. And in this text, it says the light of the world. We know in Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20, the great commission where Jesus had resurrected. He had overcome death itself. And then he sent his disciples out into the entire world to light it up. He wanted light to cover the entire earth. And so he sent his disciples. And sent in the disciples. He wanted the same type of love that he had for them to govern them and exposing this love to the world. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, he says, um, we, we are constrained by love. We are controlled by love. And then this is what he said. This is the reason why he says we're, we're that way. He said, because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all die. The love of Christ constrains us or controls us because we are hidden in him. This is the type of love that must be at work within us. When you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16, it says we look at no one from a worldly point of view because we once looked at Christ that way. We have new eyes. We have been renewed. Our vision has been restored. And then in verse 17 of that same chapter, he says, we're new creatures. We're a new creation. The old has passed. The new has come. That's who we are in Christ Jesus. We are here to light up this world. You can read the rest of that chapter to see some of the things he says about um, us being ambassadors, us speaking for the king about what, takes, what took place in that wonderful cross of Christ. He became sin so that we might become the, the righteousness of God. I want you to keep that perspective in mind as Jesus is talking to a crowd who are, who are poor, who are illiterate, who, who, who are in need physically, but he see a greater need spiritually. He's telling them, it's not on their merit. They haven't earned this, but in terms of following me, being connected to me, you are the light of the world. He doesn't stop there. He moves on to say, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. And I want to just expand this a little bit because sometimes we can look at the, the, the global stage that we're on and say, yes, we're the light of the world, but look what Jesus does next. He brings it from the world's um, standpoint to the city. A city that stands on a hill. When you have a city on a hill, you're surrounded by other places that are in the valley. But he said, you are a city on a hill. You are, as I place you in the world, you're in a position where people can see the light that I have put in you. You are a city on the hill. Notice this in the text. We're not limiting our net, our outreach to just the city. But Jesus want all to see the city on the hill. Wherever folks are located at in the dark valley, whether they're rich, poor, male, female, young, old, black, white, Asian, Latino, educated, uneducated, sick, blind, even if they choose, if they choose to come to the light, they can experience the light 
because of the city on the hill. No matter where they come from, he wants them to see the city on the hill. No matter where you are, you should be able to recognize a city on the hill. But not only that, this city on the hill, it represents hope. It represents life. Many congregations are teaching and giving doctrinal instruction, but many are not offering light, are not offering hope. Just because you teach the Bible does not mean you're offering hope. John chapter 8, if you look at the second half of that, after Jesus said he was the light of the world, look at who was arguing with him. Look at who was upset with him. They were the expert teachers. Those who knew the Bible, who knew the scripture very well. Jesus brings hope. Jesus brings healing. Jesus brings salvation. And that's what light is about in this world. Many of us have on our signs and our web pages, everyone is welcome. It seems like with a tagline like that, all churches should have people knocking down their door because they said all are welcome. But if we take an honest look at our congregations, is all welcome? Does the people, do the people in your neighborhood feel like they're welcome? Do your children's friends feel like they're welcome? Do your co-workers feel like they're welcome? I'm not asking you, have you invited them? But I'm asking you, are they welcome? So you can have the tagline all you want to. But if people can't experience the light, they won't come. If your congregation closed down, would the people in, your people in your neighborhood notice? Would your city be disappointed? If they're all a city on a hill, that light goes out. Everybody in a certain proximity will know. How about you guys? What kind of city are you for your community, for the families there, for the households represented there? As I said, we're in a pandemic right now. There's racial tension everywhere. There's economic disaster all around us. It's our time to shine. I don't know what it may be for your congregation, that's something you guys need to pray about and open yourself up to, to look around you and see how does light work during these dark days. This is not just to you, this is just for all of us. As you continue through the text in verse 15, Jesus says, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a bush, under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. So he's saying, do not hide the light. It's meant to shine. It's meant to light up the entire house. Well, you look at a house. That's a home. For all those in the home, this light should be provided. So, husband and wives, the light should be in each one of you, but in your marriage, in your parenting, just in everything about your home. Is that the case today? 
How are you building your home? We know from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, everybody's building. But some are building on sand and some are building on the rock. The rock is the solid foundation of Jesus. That means in terms of everything about that household rests on him. That's the wise building. So I encourage you to look at how you build it. So you have light of the world, a city on the hill now in the house. Light in the house, the third component. The fourth component, and as you look at verse 16, it says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give God glory to your Father who is in heaven. He makes it personal. Let your. So you go from the world to the city, to the house, to you. You are the light of the world. But it has to begin with you. It has to impact your family, it has to impact your city, and the world. A lot of times we're trying to do everything out there for the world. And our relationship isn't what it's supposed to be. God desires a relationship with each one of us in the household of faith. I say this because sometimes within the household of faith we can be the most challenged. Let me speak to you about light a little bit right now. Because of the pandemic many marriages are breaking down. People who have been married 10, 15 years they haven't spent that much time together. And so they've been in household and things are breaking down. Abuse level has gone up. Alcoholism has gone up. Pornography has gone up. I'm asking you to think about the light in you. Are you letting it shine? Paul, as he was talking about prayer, giving his testimony in Acts chapter 20. Um, 6 verse 18 he said to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and, and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me whatever you're struggling with he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world if you need to confess, confess. If you need to repent, repent. But do not hinder the light from shining through in you personally. You need it. Your family need it. The congregation need it. The world needs it. That's why God chose you for this time. Many people are worried. But if you're a child of God, you, you do not have to be worried. Paul writes in Philippians 4, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, with prayer and supplication, we got somebody we can talk to when nobody else is there. If you're in that house by yourself, God wants to hear from you. And he wants to speak to you. But we need to have a renewed mind about how we go about these things. So in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul writes, Do not allow the patterns of this world, or do not be controlled, or do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He said, this will help you. This will aid you in knowing what God's will is, good, perfect, and pleasing will. We have to have a different mindset because we're children of the light. But not only that, another little point on the side is that how we respond during this time is, is critical, it's crucial for us and for those watching. 
Paul in Philippians chapter 2, um, verses 12 through 15, roughly, I'm going to read that. And if you have notes, I like to refer to a lot of scripture. Um, just kind of so you can go search it out so you, so you can see for yourself how the Bible works together. But Paul in this passage, he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The next verse is where I'm getting to. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Look at this passage. Look back at verse 14. Paul said, do all things, do all things, not some, do all things. And so it says, without grumbling. We live in a society that loves to complain. We live in a society that feel we have the right to complain. We have a right to express ourselves. However we feel, if we don't like something, we, we live in that type of society, freedom of speech, yes. But I want you to know what Paul says here to Christians. He said, do all things without grumbling. That means that your elders, that your preacher, that your ministry staff is not the complaint department of the church. They're not. When they can have servers, when they're going to start service, stop service, well, we're going to have masks, no masks, uh, when we have classes, how many classes, all this stuff, well, I want to have classes in the morning, I want to have classes in the evening, I want to have it on this day, I want to sing this song, I don't like those songs, and sometimes we as Christians forget who we are. And we think we have the right to complain. But Paul said, do all things without grumbling. The second part of that, says, or disputing. And in our tradition, uh, we like to debate. We like to be right. Um, we like to argue sometime about scripture. We like to argue with other folk to prove them wrong. That's not our job. As light, we have another job. I mean, I'm not asking you to compromise the Bible one bit. Nobody knew the scriptures better than Jesus. Many thought they did, the experts. They thought they did, but they didn't. But notice how the light of the world handled disputes. The type of attitude he had, the type of love he extended. And then ask yourself, am I extending that same type of love? even when we disagree. But he says, do everything or all things without grumbling or disputing. He says, so that you may be blameless and innocent. He wants you to be blameless and innocent. And notice the setting. He says, in a crooked and twisted generation. That means in a perverted generation. People who are not bound to truth. People who are not bound to absolute truth, of course, but not only that in terms of perverted, but twisted. People who are, are faithless. People who don't believe in God. He said, do all things without grumbling or complaining so that you can be blameless among them and not blend with them. And he goes on to say, shining like stars in the universe or shining like lights in the world. God made us to be light, to be a beacon in the darkest of places, 
during this dark time, Jesus should be shining through us brightly. I'm not talking about just programs or activities or Zoom classes. I'm talking about in our character, in our nature, in our, in our ministry to one another and to this world. Where because God values us, we value others. Light always shines in darkness. Light, in terms of city on a hill, is hope. People right now should see how we behave, how we are responding to things and see that there is a difference in their attitudes. They should be able to look at us in our congregation as we interact together, see if we are loving people. They should be able to look at it in terms of how we interact in community from a, um, people different from us. Do we look at them as human, of value? Or do we look at them as a project or subhuman? We communicate some things even without words sometimes. But as we look at Jesus, it was very clear that he loved the world. One last thing. As you look back at creation, Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 19. God made some lights. He made one like in terms of um, the sun to govern the day and the moon to govern at night. The moon reflects the sun at night, so it provides light. Now, there is one time where that stops where the sun um, and the moon, the sun, excuse me, where the moon is not reflecting the sun. That's when the earth is in the way. When it, everything lines up, we call it an eclipse. When the earth is in between the sun and the moon, there's a total eclipse. We are the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world, but when his reflection, the only way his reflection is not in, in us is when the world, who knows the earth, but the world is in between us and him. Let light shine out of darkness. Evaluate yourself and look at introspection and make sure that you're not letting the world come between you and Jesus because he needs you to be his reflection in this dark world. I pray that if you're not, that you take a look at Jesus, the only begotten son. And I pray that you will come to him, allow him to illuminate your life, illuminate your soul, give you life itself. I pray that during this series, as you look at light out of darkness, you will be blessed. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you. And I pray that you have a great summer.